We're about to leave Vegas and we're filling up at about $6 a gallon. Nice thing about having the biggest, baddest Jeep is you might be able to pass anything on the road except a gas station. Well, this engine tries to change that. It's the LED7 and you've seen it in the background which uh, we'll talk about a lot on the test drive. We are out in the Utah countryside, somewhere around Parowan. Actually, I think close to Brian's head. We're bombing along here about 80 miles an hour. We are going about 80 miles an hour. This speedometer is off. And it's a good time to mention, this speedometer is driven by the wheel speed sensors. There's four of them in a JK. And the ABS module picks up those signals and transmits it on the bus. And that's what you're seeing. So it's not really affected by the GM side at all. So if your speedometer is off, go ahead and get yourself an AEV ProCal or some other device to set your wheel speed and make your speedometer accurate. Do yourself a favor, whatever device you have now, unlock it from your vehicle before you send it to us or before you do your build. Because some of them are more sensitive than others, like the super chips, and they may see that the tune's been modified and then try to charge it for another license or something. The reality is the speedometer is calibrated outside of the PCM, so it really shouldn't have any effect, but some of these companies have high security. And Chrysler really only supports tire sizes up to like 32 or 33 inches, so what they're doing is they're applying a multiplication factor to get your speedometer correct. One light you're seeing here is an airbag light. And that's because he's got aftermarket seats. And I want to say something about this JK because really what's most interesting about this JK is the powertrain. But this JK has been in the shop for a long time. You guys are probably seeing it in the back corner like a weird Herald job. And you say, what's a weird Herald job? Well, the guy brings in, a, back when I was doing auto repair, a guy would bring in a BSA motorcycle because everything English leaks the say he put two quarts in and it leaked out three quarts. Or the guy brings in a Saab story or Citron and wants the belt replaced and the belt on those is under the dashboard basically. So they kind of sit in the corner for a long time and unfortunately that was the fate of this Jeep. And it didn't sit in the corner because it was getting any engine conversion. It sat in the corner because it was getting an L87. The L87 is the predecessor to the L86. Just like the L84 is the predecessor of the L82, which is the predecessor of the L83. We wanted to do this build right, like everything else, which means we had to break ground. There's just no way around it. There were other shops out there taking the L87 and fitting it with an L86 harness and just getting rid of the DFM. We wanted it all to work. So we didn't take any shortcuts. Before I talk about the L87, I want to talk about this Jeep a second. This is a late model Jeep, and I've got to say, driving this Jeep really has surprised me. This Jeep tracks perfectly straight. It's got Evo double throwdown, and it's probably one of the best double throwdowns I've driven. There is no hunting of the steering wheel, as you can see. It's absolutely rock solid. It's smooth, and everything is very well done. I can tell that the customer in this Jeep knew what he wanted. Now there is a lot of stuff in this Jeep and this is pretty cool. We've got Torque app ported right into the Android stereo so we can monitor the, well I got fuel trims on there, AC pressure, coolant temp. This Jeep is running amazingly cool and one of the things we're going to talk about is our fan module because this Jeep does have our fan module. and. Uh, there's so many things to talk about on this Jeep, but on the new L87s, GM actually runs a serial network between the fans, and that's plural fans, because there's two of them on the Silverado and Denali's and all those, to the ECM. But I will say that this Jeep not only drives like a dream, but it has the functionality we want. We have tap shift, we have cruise control, we have air conditioning, we have remote start, I would say the only feature I think we don't have carried over is stop-start, which we didn't really want to support the wear and tear on the electrical system, starting and stopping so much, the parts wear out. I had a Chrysler minivan, and I had to change the batteries every year. There's two batteries, there's an auxiliary battery and a main battery, and that really started to become a drag. And it wasn't like stop-start was saving us three, four, five miles of a gallon. It, 
it was uh, maybe one or two miles to the gallon at most in city conditions. So that's one thing we didn't carry over. But what we did carry over is the dynamic fuel management. And it is very strange. I bet in a Denali you probably wouldn't feel it at all. But in this, it's very smooth. So instead of going from four to eight cylinders like active fuel management, you go two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then the reverse. So it's very smooth on its engagement. And you can hear the tone of the engine change. It's almost like a musical instrument as it goes between the cylinder count. And under a light load, at lower speeds, you could be cruising along as a two-cylinder. And it's a putt-putt Jeep. <laughs> kind of like the old uh, putt-putt boats. Remember the old steam putt-putt boats? It's a very interesting feeling, and it does seem to work. Uh, we are getting pretty decent mileage. I wouldn't say it's dramatically better than an L86 so far, but I don't have enough miles on it to make that judgment. But I will say, I've had several customers pick their Jeeps up, LT1s. All of them are pimped out, 40s, rock rails, light bars, hanging off, uh, armor, you name it, it's got it. And most of my customers are reporting 15, 16 miles to the gallon. Well, I just had a customer go to the Rubicon, for example, and he said the lowest he got was 13.6 miles per gallon in the mountains, and he got 15.6 as his best. Now, you might sneeze at that, but the reality is a new Hemi JL will get 15 miles to the gallon, and that's on like 33 inch tires with no mods. So customers are reporting they were getting 9, 10, 11, and now they're getting 13, 14, 15, which really helps in today's world with gasoline being close to $6 a gallon. Guys are so desperate to get LTs into engine conversions, and it's not just Jeeps, but in hot rods and Land Rovers and you name it. And the JK having a CAN bus is actually very difficult to support. Now we've simplified it over the last decade and it may look simple, but there's a lot of coding and R&D that went into this. We've seen other shops take the LT engines and tear them down, take the direct injection out, take the AFM or the DFM out, and they basically castrate the motor. Now what you have is an LS3 and then they run it on a simple operating system. We didn't want to do that. What we wanted to do was run the L87 and L84 the way they were designed by GM. So we have a factory harness on this. We have a factory E90 controller. It cost over $1,000 to unlock that controller, but we have full control of it now. The hardest part was the TCM. The L87 runs a T93 controller, which is the next generation. The T93 controller basically took the T87A, which is the last generation of the GM TCM in these vehicles, and they just locked it down. GM went to town. I heard the NSA actually had something to do with it because in a lot of these Allison-style transmissions, especially in the diesels, everybody's tuning them. Everybody's trying to get more power out of them, and the government knows that, so they told GM, you gotta lock these things down. And part of that was encrypting this bootloader, and it's virtually impossible to crack I actually met with one of the GM engineers that locked the bootloaders down on the 2019s and he said nobody will ever crack it. Well, I don't know if that's true, but I can tell you it's very, very difficult. But to make a long story short, we have full control of this transmission. We are running the stock 2020 or 2021 L87 transmission because they are the second generation 10 speed. They have different Prindle they have different internal parts, and they virtually are not compatible at all with the earlier operating systems. Very proud of the functionality we got in this JK. GM didn't just add solenoids to the lifter manifold assembly. They literally redesigned the engine, the accessory drive, the block, and the reason they redesigned the block was they took the lifter deactivation solenoids out of the manifold assembly in the, in the valley, and they put them right into the engine block. And I guess that simplified things or maybe made it work better, but that's what they did. So the whole engine has been redesigned. It has new controllers, new operating systems, new transmission. Everything's been locked down, but at the end of the day, it's an awesome Jeep. It drives really good, and as far as I know, it's the only one of its kind. I don't know anybody else that has supported the L87 using the stock controllers and has the functionality that we have. We're finding that these L87s are so new, 
and advanced that a lot of the scanners, even the high-end scanners like the Autels and Snap-ons don't support all the functions that they can put out. So we use GM GDS or GM software to diagnose it. While everything on this build is similar to say an L86 or an L83, pretty much everything is different. The harness is different, the power distribution center is different. We did use the same engine mounts, that is one thing that GM kept the same. Even the emission system, GM is now, we have what we call a chassis harness and it controls a fuel tank pressure sensor and an evap vent solenoid. And then of course you have your purge valve on the engine. So the GM system monitors fuel tank pressure at all times, the early JKs don't. And that way GM doesn't have a dumb system with weights and springs to vent the system. They can actually purge or vent the system at will. And that's normally controlled by the engine control module. But in the LED7 it's controlled by the fuel pump control module. So of course that changes up the wiring. I've seen shops just butcher these later LTs, whether it's the LAT or the L87, and remove all the technology, fit an early model harness on it, and then proclaim they have an L87. But this is the only L87 I know that runs the way it's supposed to run, the way GM intended it, no engine modifications. The only modifications we made to the operating systems are essentially removing codes, so it's running exactly the way it's supposed to. This Jeep does have the made for rock air system, with onboard air compressors. Of course, it's got upgraded axles. The suspension is Evo's double throat. Now, if we look over here, you can see we're running at 200 degrees. Transmission is 150. AC pressure is about 70 because I have it off. It's cool outside. But when I was running it earlier, we we're running about 150 PSI. You can see our fuel trims are a little bit negative. Uh, not too bad. I'll probably trim those up. We do have smart charging on this right through the ECM. You can see we're running close to 14 volts. And uh, take that oil temp with a grain of salt because that is a calculated value. It doesn't actually have a oil temp sensor and they always do tend to run hot. So our fan controller is in this, which works over the canvas. We did get the serial fan to work. However, the Camaro SS fan, while it is available in the serial configuration now, the standard SS fan runs off the 100 hertz pulse width. There's lots and lots of them out there. So we fitted that fan to this vehicle. And probably in the upcoming L87s, we will support the serial control fan. But at this point, they're a little harder to get and more expensive. We are back in Vegas where it's triple digits. And we're going to take this L87 out for its off-road test. We were talking about the fan controller. And our new fan controller solves a lot of problems. and. Believe it or not, we've installed more of them in Hemis than in anything else because the Hemi guys have a problem with certain configurations like manual transmissions and they want to run a PWM fan or they have an older Tipum and it won't support the PWM fan. But it's become apparent that a lot of us have other needs for the fan controller. I get guys that buy kits from other manufacturers or or doing a hot rod or whatever and they want a PWM fan. We don't like to support the Penstar fan even though our fan controller does have the software for it. But let me tell you a little bit about our fan controller. And before you start calling, we'll announce when it's available. We weren't going to support it aftermarket but the demand has been so high and it seems like there's such a need and not just for JKs but for Land Rovers, hot rods and whatever else you're using. So our fan controller has two types of inputs. One is analog, which means you literally tap the zero to five volt signal in from your coolant temp sensor, your AC pressure, your transmission temperature, whatever, into the fan controller. The fan controller will make all the calculations, then put an output PWM to control the fan in any situation. That means the fan will turn off, it won't be running all the time. That means if you turn the AC on, it'll monitor AC pressure and control the fan accordingly. Same thing for engine coolant temp, trans temp, etc. And one of the brilliant things about this fan controller is it won't overdrive the fan. And I can't emphasize this enough. A lot of our bills and other guys' bills go to tuners and they just crank that fan percentage up to 100%. 
they have it maxed out at 180 degrees. And here's the reality, these fans are, while they're very powerful, they're not gonna solve your cooling problem if you have the grill blocked, if you have 43 inch tires, if your transmission cooler is too small. There's all sorts of situations that you can get into where you can keep trying to crank that fan up, but what's gonna happen is, anything over about 90% on a PWM fan is gonna shut that fan down. So you can only go so high. So one of the biggest issues we see with guys and fans is they take it to a tuner and they just crank it up, the fan shuts down, and then they call us and say, hey, my fan shut down. What size tires are you running? 43s. What kind of transmission cooler do you have? Just a little 8x10 B&M. Well, guess what? That's not enough transmission cooling. Your transmission's exceeding 200 degrees. The fan riders, and riders are things on top of coolant temp. That would be things like intake air temp, AC condenser pressure, transmission temperature. And what these things do is add to the coolant temp. And if those things add up to more than about 90, 91%, the fan's gonna shut down. So our fan controller is fully programmable. And before I get to that, let's talk about the second input, and that's CAN. So if you have a GM operating system, like one of our LSs or LTs, all you gotta do is add the two CAN wires into the fan module, and it'll pick all these signals up right off the CAN, and then put the proper output. So it's a really simple installation. The fan controller will be shipped with a GUI, because we cannot possibly cover all the different applications guys are gonna put this thing into. So you'll be able to plug in a GUI and then program the fan controller yourself. Now remember, you still have to heed our warning about not exceeding 90%. And when you get your fan controller, it will be set up so that it won't shut down. It will not exceed the 90% on the Camaro SS fan. It will also control other fans that are 100 hertz. That includes the JL fan, the Camaro V6 fan, just a bunch of other fans that are out there. So look forward to the LED4 and the LED7. They are the newer generation of the GM powertrains in these trucks. And guys, they're not revolutionary, they're evolutionary. I don't think they're gonna get that much better mileage. I don't think they have much better power. They run awesome, just like the other LT6.2s. I do notice that this engine seems to be running cooler than the LT1 or the L86. I think part of that is the new cooling system in the LED7, because it does have a revised block and it has a different water pump. But I also think part of it is this DFM, because the dynamic fuel management makes it run on something less than eight cylinders a lot of the time. In fact, I'm noticing that I'm just all over the place running on three, four, five, six, seven cylinders. And by reducing the displacement of the engine, obviously it's putting out less heat. We put a lot of time into this LED7 to get everything functional the way we wanted it. And one of the advantages is this LED7 shares the operating system with engines like the LED4 and the L8 and the newer GM powertrains that you guys want. We don't want to go backwards and run an LS3 in a JL or a 2018 JK. So this engine brings us right up to the current technology of GM. And like Motec did way back in 2007, running the Gen 4 LSs while everybody else is running the Gen 3s. Then in 2016, Motec was running the LT engines when everybody else is running the Gen 4s. Now we're running the new generation transmission and engine in the LT lineup while other shops are still working on the earlier LTs or modifying these engines and dumbing them down to meet their operating system. We're not doing any of that. We're making everything functional. The only thing I don't think we're supporting in this L87 right now is stop start. But other than that, the second generation 10 speed, the E90 controller with the new dynamic fuel management, we have remote start working on this vehicle, we have air conditioning, we have cruise control, pretty much have everything functional in this Jeep. We're gonna take this JK up to the mountain and we'll see you soon. Here we are with the L87 out on the trail. It's a hot one today. It's like 108, 109 out right now. You can hear that SS fan winding up. We got the air conditioning on inside. We got a B&M cooler up here and the temps are actually surprisingly cool. Check this out. 199 degrees on the engine coolant temp. Trans got up to 181, but we just went up a two mile trail. So that's pretty darn good. All right, we got the drone cooling off on the air conditioning. It's running hotter than the Jeep is. And check it out, just in the few minutes it took to change the battery, the trans temp is down to 167 and our coolant temp's dropping too. That's with the air conditioning on. So we're gonna go ahead and launch and finish this trail.